And I'd like for you to be thinking about questions that you'd like to ask, because I, I really like to spend a lot of time answering your questions as opposed to lecturing. <clears throat> I didn't get the memo that I was supposed to wear a tie. Um, notice all the teachers, they all, is that a requirement? You got to wear ties? No? You just do it out of fun. Okay, well, I, don't, I own one, but I just don't wear it very often. This is uh, what I wear pretty much every day, so I figured I'd look a little bit more like you. Um, how many of you want to be an entrepreneur? You want to start something? That's virtually most everybody. It's interesting, 20% of college students today uh, say they want to be an entrepreneur. That's up. I mean, it used to be like, well, it used to be college students couldn't spell entrepreneur. I had trouble with ever, ever spelling. I still have to look at it and spell checker helps me with it. Um, so the fact that 20% of kids going into college say they want to be an entrepreneur, that's really a big deal. It used to be we wanted security. We wanted to go to work for AT&T or, or, or uh, the bank or, you know, Wall Street or something, something secure. But in today's day and age, is there such a thing as security? There isn't anymore, is there? I, I used to laugh when uh, I'd interview people or try to recruit people into my, my, my company and, well, you know, I've got a really good job and, you know, really kind of like security. And I said, well, stop right there. You're, you just disqualified yourself because, um, you know, sec wanting security is not a quality of an entrepreneur. Uh, and, 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 and yet, when people would say that to me, I, I would kind of say, are, are you serious? You think going to work for IBM is secure? You know, how often have they laid off 5,000 people, 10,000, 20,000 people? Um, you know, there is no such thing as security. I like to say that you are your security. What is it that you know that you're invaluable, that you've made yourself invaluable to somebody that is your security? And if that's not secure, if that's not uh, valuable today for the company that you work for, it would be valuable someplace else. For me, it was selling. Now, how many of you here from the selling class? Okay, I, I sold. That's what I did out of college. I, I remember talking to my father-in-law, who was a sales manager, and I said, you know, I think I want to be a salesman. And he said, well, that'd be really good as long as you can learn how to deal with rejection. I said, well, I've been rejected by a lot of people. I think I could deal with rejection. Um, and you do have to deal with a certain amount of rejection. But I enjoyed selling. Um, and selling led me to do what I'm doing today, led me into my first entrepreneurial adventure. In, uh, uh, adventure. Um, one of the qualities that is very, very useful in uh, being an entrepreneur and starting something is being able to sell. And a lot of startups are started by, entre by engineers. Any engineers here? Engineer, a couple engineers. Um, they've got a great idea. They sit and program, uh, eat nothing but pizza for three or four months, and out comes a great product, but they can't sell. So the product doesn't necessarily go anywhere because they don't know how to sell. So what I always encourage engineers is to find somebody who can and make them your partner. Partner up. Because you need somebody who can sell. And I'm going to talk some more about, uh, about selling and the, the important thing. People ask me, why do I do this? I, this is my fifth, what Cantata is my fifth venture-backed startup. Uh, three of them I started myself, two of them I became the CEO after it was started and helped raise money. So, but I've involved, been involved in five. Um, the, uh, but why do I keep doing it? It's fun. I, 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 there's nothing more fun than doing something really, really hard with a team of very talented people. And with Cantata, in Cantata's case, uh, I get to do it with some 20-year-old and 30-year-old olds who really get today's web environment. And um, I still have a lot to contribute, but 
I'm relying on them because the world has changed. Um, but I do it because it's fun. Um, it's a challenge, and, and we all need to be challenged. I, I um, went through a period where I, I was floundering. Uh, oh, this was, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago. I, was, I didn't have anything to do. I was involved with a couple of startups as an advisor, and I hated being an advisor because they wouldn't always do what I thought they should do, and it drove me crazy, or we would agree on what we ought to do, and off I'd go, and I'd come back a month later, two months later, and they hadn't done it, and they still had the same problem, and they go, what should we do? And I said, well, we had the answer 60 days ago, and that drove me crazy, um, because I've always been a person that says, if this is what you got to do, you do it, um, uh, and we'll talk more about that. I also want to say that anybody can be successful being an entrepreneur. Uh, there's certain personality types, according to Myers-Briggs, it's a test, maybe some of you have taken it, but there, there are certain per personality types that, that tend to do better being an entrepreneur, but depending on the startup that you are involved in, you can be successful almost no matter the personality, as long as you su surround yourself with people who uh, um, balance the things that you're weak at. If you're strong at something, you surround yourself with people who are better at something than you are, and together you can succeed. And usually it is a joint effort. It's a team. It requires a team. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the things about what makes good entrepreneurs, what, what makes good startups, um, and uh, hopefully a couple of ideas will stick with you. So <clears throat> let's talk about kind of the, the, the first quality that I find in people that end up succeeding being an entrepreneur um, is that they're deeply curious about stuff. And often it's about one thing, music or, or um, uh, food, restaurants. And, and they end up creating something out of that, out of their passion and their intimate knowledge of that one subject. But, but I also think it's valuable to read far and wide. I, I found myself, and I still find myself, reading all kinds of stuff. And, and it's useful because it allows me to connect dots. Well, if that's true, that applies over here, and we're doing this, so this is connected to that. Uh, and so I find it very, very useful for myself and others um, to read wide and deep. Um, so, deeply curious. And, and, you know, one of the early... Uh, indications that I, I was kind of deeply curious. This is me, believe it or not, when I was in eighth grade. And, you know, why did I do this? This is a weird thing. I mean, here I was a, uh, an eighth grader. Um, I had done a science project in seventh grade that won a top award in the, in, 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 and it was about something called paper chromatography. What the heck is paper chromatography? Well, my cousin who was a chemist, he was a biochemist, he built the largest lab in Atlanta and sold it to Smith Klein Beatsum for several hundred million dollars, did very, very well. But I asked him about, I got to do this science project and I don't know what to do about it. And he gave me some ideas and one of them was paper chromatography. Paper chromatography is something he used in a lab, although he used something far more sophisticated. But it, it's, it's nothing more than the ability to separate uh, one uh, molecule, one chemical from another chemical using a, a method. And I won't go into that. I won't bore you with that. But it, it's a simple, it can be as simple as if you put green dye on a piece of paper and you put it in uh, well, uh, a, um, what the heck do you call it? I forget now. But, but you, you're able to find out that green is actually made up of what? Blue and yellow. It separates out. Because blue moves faster in this um, solution than yellow does. So I, I did my seventh grade project, project on paper chromatography, but I was fascinated by it. I, I just, it caught my attention. Anything that caught my attention, I, I wanted to know everything about it. 
And so eighth grade comes around, I have to do another science project. I says, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to build on what I learned in seventh grade. But this time I said, you know, it would be cool to find out if there were any amino acids lost when you took oats and made them into Cheerios. Or if you took corn and you make it into corn checks. Is there something in oats that gets lost? Is there something in corn? Is there something in rice with Rice Krispies? These are all, all the cereals I ate, you know. So, um, so I, you know, I had this lab in the in the basement. My mom was always afraid I was going to blow up the house because I had chemicals you probably w would be illegal to have uh, today because I probably could have built bombs and all kinds of stuff. I'd have been, I would the NSA would have been visiting me, or the FBI would have been visiting me. But, but I, I. I was fascinated with this. And it wasn't like I was a dork, you know. I, I played soccer and I played baseball and basketball, played football later in college. I actually came here on a soccer scholarship. I was here 42 years ago. And I got thinking about that. I said, gosh, that's a long time ago. Um, but so I, I learned everything, and I, and I figured out that things that different amino acids actually amino acids are the things that make up proteins. So are there proteins, are there things about those proteins that get destroyed? And I answered that question, and I won the top award in Illinois. And I think this was a kind of a precursor. There's just some quality that I was curious about, and I would encourage you that if you're curious about certain subjects, you know. <coughs> Get into it. Learn about it. Um, part of being a, a really, really good entrepreneur is being confident. And if you're confident because you've learned something in depth about something, you're confident enough to say, I can do the same thing over here. And, and personally, that's what I think is wrong with education, is that we're not forced to learn something deeply so that you're so confident in it that you can apply it to something else. Confidence is a big deal. So um, the, uh, another quality that plays into being an entrepreneur is being disagreeable. That's interesting. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book, uh, just, just came out, David and Goliath. How many of you read it? Renee. Renee's my wife. She actually read it before I did. Malcolm Gladwell, it's a good book. You can just read the first 50 pages and get it. You don't have to read the last 150 because it covers everything in the first 50 pages. <clears throat> but he talks about um, w what is it about David that allowed him to beat Goliath? What, what is it about an entrepreneur that makes them say, I can build something that's better than the norm? It's about being disagreeable. Not disagreeable as in, I'm in an argument all the time, although I get in my arguments. Um, and I can't help it if I'm right most of the time. But um, there's something about an entrepreneur who says, you know, that's not the right way to do it. You know, I'm, it, it's really a problem uh, for me. Um, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I walk into a restaurant, walk into a building, whatever, I'm always looking and, and, and there's something that goes off in me and it says, you know, they could make this a little bit better if they just did this, you know. Uh, it's my, my daughter, six years ago, uh, had to, uh, to sit me down and said, Dad, you know, I got, to, had, I got divorced and um, I had to get back into the marketplace, so to speak. And uh, she pointed out to me that, you know, one of my problems was um, my entrepreneur uh, uh, makeup, that I was always saying, you know, this is really, really good, but it could be a little bit better. It, a bit, it could always be a little better. And so I had to turn that off. And, and there's times that you have to turn that off if you're going to succeed. But in the world of business, in the world of starting companies, um, an entrepreneur, it's very, very normal to look at your product, look at your service, look at whatever you're doing, look at the way they, an they answer the phone, look at the website that you have, uh, look at everything you're doing and saying, I don't like that word. I drive my people crazy because I look at 
No, it, you know, it, this doesn't quite say, I think we confuse people with this one sentence or this one word. Are you serious? That one word? Yes, that one word. It's important. Um, so there, there's a, uh, there, there's, you, you have to have a willingness and ability to hold a contrarian opinion. In the, in the case of cantata, we're going into a marketplace where there's three giants. Already, you know, people would say it's a mature market. Why in the heck would you go there? But the more and more we looked at it, we said, nah, those guys, especially the leader, very, very um, ripe for disruption. But we were the only ones who really kind of held that view. But now people look at what we're about to do and they say, uh-huh, yeah, you're right. You know, who would have thought of it? Who would, who would have said that? Um, so, so having the strength of conviction to read widely, learn, and say, you know, the whole world pretty much believes that, but I don't believe that. I believe this. Something, you know, I brush my teeth with crash. No, I, you know, I like, I like uh, sodium bicarbonate. I'm going to brush my teeth with sodium bicarbonate. I mean, I hold lots of <laughs> contrarian opinions. And it might be fun to talk about them, but we don't have time to do that. But this is what Malcolm Bal Balridge found was the most important element in being a successful entrepreneur, was the ability to be disagreeable. Everybody thinks this, I think that. I have a saying in my company, if you have data to support what you're saying, let's go with that. But if you just have opinions, let's go with mine, my opinion. You know, it's just that, that's, that confidence um, is important. Now, that's not, again, it's not to mean you get in arguments. Uh, and it's important to get consensus amongst your team. But there comes times where you have to make an arbitrary decision. There is time where not everybody agrees, so we're going to do what I think. So being disagreeable. The other two qualities, interestingly, were um, openness and um, conscientiousness. The open would go back to what I was saying about reading far and wide and being open to ideas. What are people saying? Um, conscientious is follow through. I do what I say. Um, uh, I can, you know, I tell entrepreneurs come to me and ask me, well, what do you think of this idea? And I love to sit with them and listen to their ideas and what they've done and, and, and what they're thinking about doing. And um, it could be a good idea, but the next thing I look for is, can this person and their team execute that idea? Execution is far more important than the idea. In fact, sometimes I'll have an entrepreneur who wants me to sign a non-disclosure, and I say, no, I don't do those. I go, why, why not? I said, well, if there isn't already six people in a garage working on your idea, it's probably a dumb idea. I go, oh, OK, that makes sense. Uh, so usually they'll talk to me about the idea. Sometimes they won't, but I won't sign a non-disclosure. There's lots of reasons why I won't. It's, it can be problematic. All right, next thing. How many of you here can sing and dance? Nobody can dance? Or sing? What do I mean by singing and dancing? There are times in a, in, when you're building a company that you just got to be able to sing and dance. This kind of goes back to being able to sell. I had a, I'll tell you a story. I, I was running ACT, um, and I was only 35 years old. And all I had ever been before was a salesman for about seven, well, for about, what, 15 years. Right out of college, so I was about 35. I was selling. And... <clears throat> Uh, ACT was doing okay, but we were having trouble raising money. Um, uh, I had to constantly raise money because we were constantly running out. <laughs> Number one job of a CEO of a, of a startup is don't run out of money. Um, so I was constantly raising money, and I was having trouble. I was 35 years old, and we had a guy named Steve Marceau who was a San Antonio boy. ACT was done in Dallas, Texas, but I had met this guy who's in San Antonio, and he was a true Texan. And uh, 
the very, I had convinced him to invest in the company and also to invite him to be on the board because he, he, he was an accountant, a lawyer, and an entrepreneur by experience. He had built a company, went public on New York Stock Exchange, very, very successful, still a young guy. So I wanted him on the board, and he became a mentor ultimately to me. Well, he came to his very first board meeting. And the board meeting didn't go real well because it got on to this fact that I was having a hard time raising money. And I had raised money. I got money from Steve. But getting enough money was hard. And one of my board members, who was kind of an old codger and just always you know, negative and stuff, and he goes, well, maybe what we need is a professional management to come in, a professional manager, somebody with gray hair. And, you know, Pat Young, he maybe just doesn't know how to do this. And Steve Marceau right away said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, whoa. He said, if, if you're going to bring in professional management, I want my money back. And the they, he, guy looked at him and said, well, why? Why would, why would you want money? He says, because if you're going to bring in professional management, I want out, because that's not what's needed now. Between now and when this company is successful, there's a whole lot of singing and dancing that's got to take place. And he knows how to sing and dance. If he has to turn this thing into an oil company, he will in order to be successful. There's a certain quality of being able to do the soft shoe when you need to and to think on your feet and to say the things that, that, that you mean and that are true, but... Uh, you know, you know how you have to be able to say the right things and the right, you have to be able to read a situation. I call that singing and dancing. And that comes back to confidence, having the confidence to be able to just say, uh, I, I can do this. Another word that I would throw in here is formidable. There was an article about entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that are successful have this quality that they're formidable. You know, they can withstand somebody saying, well, you're, you know, your idea is not, is it really that good? Well, yeah, it is because of this and this and this. Well, what about this? Challenges. Being able to stand up to that, it's, it comes out of the ability to sing and dance. The other is uh, attention to detail. Oh, yeah. Got your attention, right? Attention to detail. I'm not particularly attentive to details unless I'm really, really interested in something. Uh, but once I get interested in something, I'm, I'm very, very focused on that. That's actually a description of somebody with ADD, uh, which one would, many have argued that I have. Huh? What did you say? I'm sorry. The, the, uh, the thing about... Uh, being an entrepreneur, and Malcolm Gladwell also talks about this in his book, that some things that some people consider to be um, a hindrance can actually be a positive. How many of you, well, no, I won't ask you how many of you are ADD, because most of you probably are, um, but I won't embarrass you. You know, the thing about ADD people is, yeah, they get destruction, and they like to look around. They like to read lots of things and, and start projects and stuff. But once they get interested, they become hyper-focused because it releases chemicals in the brain and makes them feel really, really good, and, and they are focused. So that's why I did some of the things I did because it was, like, medicinal. Um, dyslexia is another thing. People have to work really, really hard at getting words Anything you have to work really hard at to overcome can be a benefit. Don't look at it, at it as, oh, that's a problem that's going to prevent me from doing it. No. If, in your overcoming of those things, you can develop qualities and characteristics that can benefit you as an entrepreneur. Um, one element, though, I'd like to talk to you about attention to detail. There's this, uh, in the tech world, there's this concept, and, and you, many of you probably have heard it. You may have even studied it in your classes. It's called a, build a minimally viable product, an MVP. Anybody familiar with that concept? Build something that kind of works, get it out there, and see what people think. Yes? No? Is that a new concept? 
Okay, it, in Silicon Valley, in, in tech communities, that's, boy, that's a, a big conversation. Build a minimally viable product. I happen to not agree with it. That there's a lot of products that get built, and they're half-assed. They're, they kind of sort of work. They're ugly. They work a little bit, and the idea is you put it out there and get feedback, and uh, there's a lot of benefit to uh, getting that feedback. But the problem is, at the same time, there has developed um, an incredibly intolerant um, uh, view of using things that aren't any good. How many of you download something on your your phone or on your on your computer or on your on your iPad? You play with it for less than a minute, and you go, "This is crap." Boom, gone. It might be a really really good idea, but it was done so poorly there wasn't anything that caught your attention that said this is useful. So if you're going to build something, whatever it is you build, you might not you you can't do all the features that are required, but the ones that you do, they ought to be really, really good. It's what I call maximally beautiful product, an MVP instead of an MVP. It's got to be maximally beautiful. One of the things that made ACT different, and by the way, are any of you familiar with ACT? Anybody ever use it? Boy, that's amazing. That's amazing. Uh, it, it's an old product, but there's still two and a half million people using it. Uh, it's not my product. I sold it back in 2001, but uh, I just thought maybe. How many of you heard of it? Maybe? Nobody's even heard of it. Why am I, why am I giving this talk? <laughs> the uh, act was, uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. Never mind. Um, okay. So the, the real key here is, is you know, the thing that made Steve Jobs great, and if any, if, have you read his autobiography, seen the movie, whatever, for the most part, he was an ass. I mean, he was, a, he was an ass. But he was incredibly focused on details. And often it made products late, and it created other problems, but the products that he created were amazingly beautiful, insanely great, as he would say. Well, we may not have the, the resources uh, always that he had, and he had lots of resources to be able to do that. But there, there is, you, if you are going to do something, whatever it is, if it's a service, if it's a product, if it's an insurance agency, I don't care what it is, make it great. How do I make this better than the insurance agent's agent down the street? How do I stand out? We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Only fanatics build great products. And usually they do it in a garage. That, that was a statement about 80 years ago. Now, not so much in a garage. But only fanatics build a great product. What, what, you know, what's the last great product that came from IBM? What's the last great product that came from Microsoft? Apple really is one of the only companies that have fostered this culture of, of setting aside very small teams and saying, do, do what you want, you know, do something really great. Google had it. I think they're losing it. You're starting to see that they've gotten rid of their policy that says to the engineers, you can work on anything you want to 20% of the time. You can't do that no more. So I, I think Google is in danger of losing that. But Apple, I think, uh, for at least a little while, Jobs so infused that, that creativity inside of Apple that I think we will continue to see innovation, for the most part, out of Apple. But their focus on details and spelling it right. Magic bullet. Steve Marceau was the one who taught me this. I used to say, gosh, if we could just get sales to $200,000 a month, gosh, if we could just do that. Or if we could get this new release out finally with all these features, man, that would be, that would be the thing. 
And he finally heard, the, heard me say this enough. He said, Pat, Pat, no. There is no magic bullet. There is no one thing that's going to set you apart. There's no one thing that is going to make you successful and your company successful. It's really more like seven or eight or nine things that you and somebody else, other people, wake up every morning thinking about doing those nine things and doing them over and over and over and over again. And all the while looking for a tenth, something that works, what I call points of leverage. If I push here, this goes up. And if I can push here harder, it goes up faster and harder and higher. Okay? It, it's no, there is no silver bullet. There is no magic bullet. It's a bunch of things, and that goes to execution. What are the things that really matter, and do I have someone focusing on those things? People would ask, well, what would you do if if you uh, raise more money, if you had another venture capital round, and I would almost always say, I wouldn't do anything different. I'd just do more of the same. I have, I have two people w waking up worried about selling. I'd have eight people waking up worrying about selling pay if, you, if you gave me more money. And if I did that, this is what would be the results in sales. So there's no magic bullet. Now, marketing people in here, there are a couple I know. Um, I'm sorry, your name, Dan Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who is, uh, has a marketing background. How many other marketing people in here? OK. Um, marketing in a startup, I believe, is one of the very most important things. I, I, uh, I like to say that marketing is too important to leave to the marketing department. I, I get involved in marketing. I'm much more of a marketer than I am a sales guy. Um, and, and marketing really in a startup is where things really, really happen. But I want to talk about one element of marketing. What happened there? Um, is the AV guy here? Okay. You may have timed up on my... Yeah, that's what happened. Wow, we had a crash. Okay, good. <clears throat> the power of positioning. With, with ACT, ACT was a contact manager. It, although that's not what we called it right at first. Um, it helped people maintain all the information about their contacts. Who do I know? What did we last talk about? What do I have to talk about next? What do I need to do before I talk about with them? Um, uh, write them a letter, write it, send a fax, you know, all the things. You know, I met with them. What, what, what did we talk about? And it, it, it was all about making me as a salesperson more productive. And I developed ACT while I was a salesman selling computers. And I taught myself how to program because uh, I, I looked around for, for software for salespeople, and there wasn't any. So I said, I want one. So I, started, I taught myself how to program. And uh, three years later or so, I had what ended up being a prototype of what eventually became ACT. I was the last person, really, who should have ever been successful writing a program uh, or, or, or doing that. I, I took one course here at EIU. And, Fortran. I, I hope they don't still teach that. But I took a course in Fortran and I got a D in it. So, and truth is, the only reason I got a D in it is because I sat next to my fraternity brother. So, uh, you know, I should never have been successful doing this, but I once again got interested in something. I wanted something. I wanted a program to help me manage my context. So, over a period of three years, I wrote it and didn't realize that what I was writing turned out to be a prototype for what became uh, a, a, a product that created a category. Let's talk about how that category was created um, and the importance of it. The, when we launched, we didn't know what to, how to talk about it. Well, it's, it's kind of a database thing with a word processor and a calendar thing. And uh, it dials the phone, and it allows you to keep notes and, and all of that. It's, it's really cool. And people would go, huh? 
but, but typically if we then had an opportunity to show it to them, they would go, oh, okay, I get it. I get it and I want one. But we didn't know how to talk about it. And it's really important to have an elevator pitch, uh, uh, um, a tagline that describes what it is you do. What is it that makes you different? And so I was reading a book called Marketing Warfare. They had written a number of books. They, uh, Al Reese, Jack Trout, wrote a book called Positioning. And they created, uh, coined a term that has been in marketing one of the most critical uh, uh, ideas to come. And that was back in the 60s that they did that. Has, have any of you ever read a book by Al Reese and Jack Trout? Yes? No. Okay, I would encourage you to read the updated version of it. There's a book called Focus by Al Rees. Al is the smarter of the two guys, so you'll get the best. But um, the, the whole idea is there's power in focus. We do this one thing extraordinarily well, and we're able to describe it. This is what we do. We're the best at it. So I read one of their books called Marketing Warfare, and I said, the answer's in here. This is about five months after we launched ACT, and, and we'd sold several hundred copies, and, but we were really struggling. And I said, I know the answer is here, but I can't apply it to me. So I picked up the phone, called uh, their office. Jack Trout got on the phone. I said, Jack, I know you work for some of the biggest companies in the world, do you ever work for a tiny little gnat of a company? Because we are that. We're a tiny little company. And he says, yeah, actually we do. We like to work with small companies because usually they'll actually listen to us. Big companies won't. Uh, and they're brilliant marketing guys. So he said, but, but we, won't, we don't do anything that we don't find interesting. So if what you're doing is an interesting, you know, we won't. We wouldn't want to work with you. So he said, "Send me all everything you got, all your literature, the box, the program, anything you got. Send it all to me. So and then call me back in two weeks." So I sent it to him. Two weeks later, I, I called him back and he said, "I said, Jack, what do you think?" He said, "He said this is really, really interesting. Yes, we can uh, we can help you, and you really need our help." And we did. We need. We we didn't know how to describe it. So I and my team went up to New York to, to spend a day with Al Reese and Jack Trout. Um, Al Reese today charges $80,000 a day. If you want a day with Al Reese, it's $80,000. We got in, we got both of them for less than $5,000, so I got a real deal. Of course, that's back in 1987. But we got to spend uh, the day with them, and in 45 minutes, they had basically solved our problem. They said, okay, what you're doing is you're creating a new category. It doesn't exist. Nobody knows what it is. It's called contact management. You manage contacts. And you are the best-selling contact manager. So when you describe your, what, what is ACT, it's a best-selling contact manager. And I said, you know, I, I don't feel real comfortable with that because you know, we've only sold a couple hundred copies of, of ACT, you know, and I, I don't know that I feel cut making that big old claim. He says, well, is there any other software program out there that calls themselves a contact manager? I said, no. He said, well, that makes you the best-selling contact manager, even though you only sold a couple hundred. Um, so that's what we did. Everybody in the, in the company, every time they said the word ACT, it always followed the best-selling contact manager. Whenever you talk to anybody, that's what it was. Hi, I'm with, uh, I'm with ACT and best-selling contact manager. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when you start your company, you need to think about, what are we? What is it that we do? What is our focus? We are the, I'm the best car wash in Charleston. Charleston and Mattoon. And, and it's okay to begin to expand, expand that. But start with something, something that you can accomplish. We are the best, we're the first, we're the leading. It's really, really important to answer that question. Amazon, they do thousands of things a day, but they start out by selling books. 
That's all they sold. Books. What do we sell? We sell books. And they did that for a long time before they ever started selling anything else. And it's okay, as long as you establish a dominant position in something, to begin to branch out. But you only have one shot at owning a position in the mind. A position. That's why it's called positioning. People will only allow you to, to occupy one thing. You can't be two at, at the start. Anytime I hear an entrepreneur says, well, I do this and this, as soon as I hear the and, I go, Mitch has got a, he's got a problem. She's got a problem. There can't be an and. We do one thing and we do it better than anybody else. And in some way, we're better than anybody else. Geography, product, the distribution method, whatever it is, we do it better than anybody else. With ACT, we're the best selling contact manager, my second company. Sales Logics, we were the leading CRM product, customer relationship management, leading CRM product for the mid market. So uh, it was a, a section of the market. There was enterprise and there was retail. We were the mid market leader, and, and we were. Um, and it was important to carve out that focus. So, um, the importance of leadership. You know, what I have found is that people who will work for you, who want to come to work for a startup, and if you ultimately want to start your own, it, it, it's not bad to start out and start working in another one as an you know, individual contributor. And, and maybe someday you'll have the idea that, that allows you to start your own. But what I have found is that people want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. We're changing the world. We're changing Charleston. We're changing, you know, Illinois. Whatever, whatever it is, we're, I'm a part of something bigger than myself. And that's a part of leadership. Be, being able to convey the mission. We're on a mission. Um, part of that is having an enemy. Um, who, who, in fact, if you can't name who your enemy is, Who's the, com who's the competitor that we hate the most, that we want to beat? That's a rallying cry that people go, yeah, we want to beat them. Doggone it, we want to beat them. They're, they're the ones we're going after. It's important to have an enemy. It's useful. Another thing about leadership is what I, I like to say, it's, it's, re it's refusing to show your own panic. There are times in a startup where bad stuff happens. And everybody else around you is, man, they're panicking. It's, they're, it, it's chaos. Uh, it's really, really important to recognize that at that moment, they're looking at you. How are you going to react? And I've, I've had to learn to say, okay, what role, even though I'm scared to death, I, this is really bad, what role do I need to play right now? And there's a bit of acting, goes back to singing and dancing. There's a bit of acting that's useful, being an entrepreneur. Taking on a role, even though I'm in a state of panic. Uh, somebody's calling me. That doesn't show up over there. Um, I'm not going to show the panic, because we'll figure this out. We've had 100 things like this. We'll figure it out. Um, so that's important. Um, Ambiguity. Ambiguity is a really, really big word. I know I like to use big words. I know another big word, uh, delicatessen. That's, that's another big word. Boy, people here, are you awake? Hello. I guess I'm just, my jokes work in Arizona, you know, but they don't work here, I guess. I don't know. What is it about Illinois people? You know, I've been away for 20 years. I don't know. I'm missing something. Ambiguity. Being comfortable with ambiguity, what does that mean? There's lots of times when you don't know what to do. And you gather data, as much data as you can, but you still don't know what to do. And you talk with your team, and nobody really knows what to do, but you've got to do something. You have to be comfortable with making a decision when it's not clear what you should do. 
because you have to do this a hundred times in a month. You have to make small decisions, lots of decisions, and you have to be comfortable to do it in doing it because action is far better than inaction in most cases. There are times to put something off, and you can, but most of the time you can't. You know, this person who's working for us is pretty good, but I think we can get a person that's really a lot better at it, and we really need a person, that should, but we like them. It's my cousin. I've had that situation. My best, it's a best friend. Oh, it's ambiguous. Could, do, you th do I think he can step up and finally get there? I don't, I don't know. But my gut instinct is I don't think so. So he's gone. You get somebody else, and hopefully it turns out better. Most of the time, it does. There's thousands of decisions like that. Should we go to that trade conference that we can't quite afford? You know, should I go on the, the sales call? I went on sales calls where, you know, I really didn't have the money to go on the sales calls. I, I, I joked that I started ACT with Visa, MasterCard, and American Express being my first venture capitalist. And they decided to pull their support pretty early on uh, where I ran out of, I, well, I almost never ran out of credit cards because I collected them. Whenever I'd get an invitation, you know, to, to hey, $1,500 of credit, I said yes, and I collected them. And there were many times where they took that card, and I said, here's another one. So that's how I funded the company to start out. Uh, and you have to be really comfortable with ambiguity. The next one is, uh, these all kind of seem the same, but they're really not. Each one's a little different. And having some of it is a requirement. Persistent. Persistence you know, sounds like uh, um, pestering because it kind of is persistent. I just keep doing the same thing. Yeah, the guy said me, called and said, uh, told me no twice already, but I'm going back. I've got a better story for him now. I'm going to ask him a third time to invest in the company or to buy my product or whatever it is. I'm persistent. Um, I'm tenacious. Tenacious is... Okay, there's new information that's come up, and, and it doesn't quite agree with what um, you know, we've been doing, and, but it's right, and what we're doing is wrong, so I'm going to do it different. I'm going to pivot. I'm going to, you know, I'm just, I'm going to make this thing work. And then perseverance from the word severe. When things get severe, you keep on going. You, you, you have to have some of these qualities to succeed. Um, the next one is generous. Be generous. Uh, lots of entrepreneurs I've talked with, they say, Pat, you know, <clears throat> I started this company. I own 100% of it. I got 30 people working in the company. Should I have stock options? Should I give some equity to the 30 people that work for me or maybe my team? And I said, duh, absolutely, absolutely. Everybody in your company should be an owner. They should feel like they are, that they are part of something bigger. That they, if they work their ass off, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to benefit from it. I worked for a couple of companies prior to starting my own where, man, I worked really, really, really hard. And I felt like, all I get is a salary or, and, and a commission when I sell stuff. But I'm doing a lot of other stuff that, you know, I should be part of the company. And, and it really irritated me. Maybe it was just me. But a lot of entrepreneurs want to hold it to themselves. I want to own 100%. Totally, absolutely wrong. You, you, you should want to create as many successful, hopefully millionaires, as you possibly can. I've, I've had the good fortune of creating many dozen millionaires. And there's nothing that feels greater when uh, you, you, have a, you go public or whatever and... 40 people are looking at you saying, shoot, I just became a millionaire. That's pretty cool. So be generous. Um, the, one of the last things I'm going to talk about is um, the importance of being good to yourself. Uh, okay, fanaticism has its place. 
Um, but there's times where you got to go, I'm done. Uh, you know, I'm, I need a rest. I need to go on vacation. One of the things I did was, you know, I, my job took me away from my family. I had four kids. But I was, if I could be at their soccer games, their baseball games, their basketball games, their, their theater, whatever it was, I was there if I could possibly do it. And it made a difference. that My kids came come back over the years and said that was so important. Um, but it was important for me to maintain some balance. It's important to get away from your company. Um, it, it, it's, part of, it's also a part of a, re, a recognition that you are not your company. In other words, your company is not you. We tend to pour so much into our companies, it's like they become us, but they're not us. They can succeed or fail, but that doesn't mean I'm a success or a failure. I, I'm just who I am. I'm a steward of this company. I do the best I can, and that's the best I can. And when I need help, I get outside help. But that's the best I can do. Um, so, so there has to be, again, some, of the, some separation and exercising and whatever it is, meditation or yoga or uh, coffee clubs. I don't care what it is, sports. Do something else. Take care of yourself. Um, it, it's, it, it is a shame uh, that so many people, you know, they sacrifice their family, their marriage, everything, whatever, and uh, all for their company. That's, that's not a healthy thing. 